I'm, I'm almost ready to ask Tommy to come on the stage, but there's just one little thing I want to say. Yesterday, we saw feats of deep learning. And today, I'd like to try to have a very different kind of conversation. The organizers of the colloquium, uh, Matan Gavish, David Donahoe, Martha Raghu, Ben Recht, and myself, banded together because we thought there were deep methodological problems in the way we were doing machine learning. And we wanted to talk about it. <clears throat> As engineers, some of us are trained to build complex systems by assembling these uh, simple modules that we understand well together. This is how we build reliability into our systems, debuggability and um, upgradability. Deep learning operates by a very different set of principles. Uh, sure, you start with simple enough modules, and then you start stirring them together. And then maybe you add some weird croutons in there, and you turn up the heat. And our methodology for turning the soup into something palatable is still in its infancy. And I wanted to talk about what would a scientific narrative for building that soup uh, look like? What would that narrative need to look like for us to engineer better systems? What are the roadblocks for us to get there? And who can help us move those roadblocks? These are the topics I'm hoping we can talk about today and that we can talk about during the breaks and that our speakers will broach. So for our first speaker, um, I want to introduce you to Tommy, uh, dear teacher and mentor. He'll talk about some theoretical work that he's been doing. Okay, thank you. So, um, um, I've been uh, um, intrigued for the last three years, uh, as many of, of you, about uh, why uh, deep networks uh, work as well as they do, um, especially because some people, including colleagues of mine, are using them to understand parts of the brain, like visual cortex, and it seems uh, quite ironic that they try to understand something we don't understand with using something that we don't understand. So <laughs> that's the motivation. And the three questions that I posed myself um, um, some time ago were uh, basically an approximation, optimization, and uh, generalization. First of all, why and when are deep networks better then shallow networks, why? And then why it's relatively easy to find global minima in such a huge optimization problem like it's in, um, implied in training, um, a network with millions of parameters. And uh, finally, um, since the answer to the second question is over parameterization, uh, the qu third question is why they managed to generalize. And, you know, we'll hear more about some of these questions, especially, I guess, the last one in the next two talks. Um, we're going to be more formal. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a mathematician, so I'm a physicist, so I'm happy with continuous mathematics and uh, some uh, informal proof, take that into account. Um, so, first question is uh, deep and shallow. It was known since the 80s, and this was partly why in the 80s people um, did not uh, explore very much uh, deep, deep networks with more than one hidden layer is uh, because it was known that they are universal approximator, kind of virus trust theorem. Both shallow and deep networks can approximate any continuous function of, of d variables on a bounded interval uh, with very, very um, weak constraints on the nonlinearity. Um, okay. However, um, both of them um, suffer the so-called curse of dimensionality. If you want an approximation uh, within epsilon in some norm, okay, the sup norm, um, typically you need uh, epsilon to the minus d, where d is the number of variables, the dimensionality of your space parameters. Um, there is a factor of about the smoothness that I regret for now, and, and, and this becomes large very quickly. Imagine epsilon is 10%. These 10 pixels inputs, you have 10 to the 10, which is a large number. This is an upper bound, 
for general functions. So, however, um, there is a class of functions for which deep networks, but not shallow networks, don't suffer from this curse of dimensionality. And these are functions that are functions of functions of functions, where the constituent functions have low fixed dimensionality. For instance, you see here a graph, which is the graph of a function, graph of the function on the left is made up, each node is a function of two variables, and the function of two variables is the one that um, essentially imposes the bound on the uh, number of parameters, and the rest is, is linear. So here is something that deep networks can do and shallow networks cannot do. Escape the curse of dimensionality for function of a certain type. And it's interesting that the type of networks that can do this are very similar to convolutional networks in terms of this architecture of compositional. So the, this two would be the dimensionality of the kernel in this case. In many image, um, like ImageNet or CIFAR, the kernel is three by three. So B9, the dimensionality of the constituent function. It's interesting that the, the magic of making the exponential disappear is not due to, to the convolution, to the fact that uh, um, you have a, a weight sharing. That's not the, the magic. This helps, but is the locality of the constituent functions. So the fact that they have a, a small number of variables. And um, there are some interesting questions about um, uh, whether at some level this uh, um, uh, functions of function with this hierarchical local structure where each unit look at a small number of units below is, uh, you know, the m simplest one. Uh, it corresponds to sparse polynomials. So there is a very close correspondence with the structure of polynomials in, um, in uh, um, um, a large number of uh, variables. Um, and there are interesting questions, why should the problems like the ones that the convolutional networks solve, by the way, convolutional networks are the ones that have been really successful, not, and this would be an explanation perhaps, is uh, um, um, why those problems are, have this structure. It makes intuitive sense that uh, images are compositional, don't need to have this pixel interact with this, I can recognize patches here and then it make the patches interact. But it's an open question to characterize uh, the structure of these problems. Okay, optimization. Optimization, there are in the meantime quite a number of results that uh, typically involve uh, hundreds of pages in proving things. Here is a very uh, semi-formal approach um, that um, reaches the same conclusion that uh, stochastic gradient descent should converge most of the time to global minima. And, uh, and so what I'm doing here, I'm uh, <coughs> replacing each RLU in a network used, for instance, to solve CIFAR by a univariate polynomial. In this case, is a polynomial of nine degrees, but it can be small, uh, lower degree. And then when it, we have this network with uh, polynomial instead of RLUs, the behavior in training and testing is exactly the same, as far as we can say, as the original RLU network. Okay, now, since you have this uh, polynomial nonlinearities, your network now is a polynomial in many variables and high degree. And you can use, uh, um, Bezu theorem, that essentially is the analog for pol set of polynomial equations of, uh, you know, the, the results on set of linear equations. And it tells you, first of all, that for um, a situation in which you have zero loss, you're fitting exactly the data, then you have a lot of solutions. Um, you know, it's an upper bound, what Bezu theorem gives you, but it's more than atoms in the universe. And, uh, but the important thing is this one, is that um, you have um, as many equations as parameters for the critical points of the gradient, and you have um, much fewer equations than parameters for the global zero, the interpolation situation. 
And this is under the assumption that you have many more parameters than uh, data points. For instance, CIFAR, typically you have uh, 60,000 data point. So small n is 60,000. And um, yeah, there is a typo, capital N is 60,000. Capital W is like 300,000 or so. So conclusion is global minima are degenerate. And um, this comes from Bezout theorem and other critical points of the gradient generically with probability one if you assume random data is uh, are isolated. Okay. Now, let me consider um, now a stochastic gradient descent, which is what is typically used. Um, and uh, I write it here as a stochastic, uh, as a gradient descent plus a derivative of the Brownian motion term, a white noise term. I can do the same for stochastic gradient. And stochastic gradient itself, it's similar, not equivalent by any means, is similar to, um, um, to stochastic gradient. Um, because there is not randomness in an added noise term, but there is randomness in the choice of the mini batch. And in this case, it's called the Langevin equation, stochastic differential equation. The asymptotic solution is the, the probability distribution of the state is the Boltzmann distribution. And, uh, and it's pretty clear because of its form that if you have minima that have a larger volume than others, most of the probability will concentrate on them, especially in high dimensions. So for instance, this graph shows two minima, equal depth, but one is degenerate, this is two dimension, and one is isolated. And you look for the Boltzmann um, distribution of this um, loss function, and you see that in one dimension on the, up on the left, you still see the smaller minimum, although the depth is the same. But when you go up to five dimensions, for instance, you only see a gradient descent only discovers the big minimum, right? And you are not in five dimensions, you are in 300,000 or so. So there is a very strong concentration of probability phenomena. Okay, so the conclusion putting together the two things is that <coughs> the SGD will find with high probability <coughs> degenerate minima, which are the global minima, and will not um, see the local minima with, will, with high probability be isolated. Okay, in, uh, um, so this was under the assumption of over-parameterization. Now the question is, if you have more parameters than data, um, how can you generalize? Um, how much time do I have? I just took a picture. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, typically, the loss function that you want to minimize are, say, the square loss for aggression and something <clears throat> like exponential loss type, like, like uh, the cross entropy or the logistic. I choose here the, the, the exponential loss for simplicity. And so these are the, your loss that you want to minimize, typically with the gradient descent. So you get equations like this in the, your parameters, which are the weights. Um, and you have uh, a, a matrix of weight um, at each layer k in the network. So we have a set of coupled um, differential equations, nonlinear. Um, in which the Hessian, in general, will be, will be degenerate, or it's difficult to say what will be. Okay, I'm taking now the, um, the uh, assumption to use with RLU networks, and the RLU networks have um, a property which makes them quite similar to linear function, which is this uh, one homogeneity or positive homogeneity, which is, um, which gives you this property that if I have a network F of W, uh, these are the parameters and X is the input, then I can write it as the product of the Frobenius norms, 
of each layer, this rho k, time f tilde, which is a network in which all the weights are normalized, each layer by its Frobenius norm. Um, okay, so this f tilde is a normalized network. Each uh, layer has uh, Frobenius norm one. And um, yeah, I don't know, is, is, um, is Ben, ben Recht around? Okay, because this is just for Ben. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was a co-author in this outrageous paper. <laughs> um, actually, it was quite, quite, in, quite stimulating, but in which essentially um, the implicit claim was that we need a new theory of generalization. <laughs> what does rethinking mean? Um, come on. What does rethinking mean? I want a definition from you. Well, you think about again. Chiwan was my student. I, so, still, still, what does, where does it say that we need a new theory? <laughs> <laughs> All right. A lot of people understood it that way. But, but anyway. That means, that means they just can't read. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be provocative. I'm being provocative right now. I'm being provocative right now. What, where exactly in the paper does it say we need a new theory? Okay, that's good. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> because it does not. It does not even require rethink in generalization. Let, let, let me lose, so, show you something. No, I mean this, I mean, okay, this I'm is generalization. Generalization means, um, in my view, the simple version of it. Uh, that are technical is... I, I don't need to get up there. I mean, I'm fine. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, tell me, a generalization means that uh, if you have a, um, an error in training or a performance in training, you can, from this, uh, is a good proxy for your, uh, or a proxy of which you know how good it is for performance in testing. Do we agree on that? <laughs> Thank you, Ali. <laughs> um, ben, it's been a very stimulating paper. <laughs> so, do you agree, all agree that in this case, I'm not plot plotting the classification error. Um, so many of the things said in the paper are true for the classification error, but I'm just plotting the cross entropy loss in training versus the, um, you know, the cross entropy loss in testing versus the training. And I don't see any predictability by looking at how well I'm doing on the training to predict how well I'm going to do on testing. Um, now, if I do the same thing, but I, I um, th by the way, each one of these points is a network trained on the same data, which is CIFR, but with different, slightly different initial condition, and there is some randomness in the training. So they result in networks that uh, behave in a similar way, but not exactly equal. They have somewhat different testing errors, right? And now, if I take exactly the same network, I don't do anything apart normalizing them. So I divide each layer by its uh, Frobenius norm. Basically means I just divide the output by some number, but uh, by a number that depends on the individual network. Well, then what I get is this. So now I have that the training loss is a very good predictor of the testing loss. And the red point up there is actually this uh, uh, randomized um, data that uh, was used by Q1 and so on. So this is a case in which you randomize the label of the data in uh, CIFR, the, you randomize the labels, and, uh, and so you train with zero error, classification error, but the test is random. And this still predict how well this is going to do. So not well, but it's a good prediction. And this comes directly from the classical generalization bounds. 
Uh, this is with ResNet, same story. Okay, anyway, the close parenthesis. Um, so what are really interesting is classification, and here the classical generalization bounds, and people like Peter and so on uh, worked on, on this. Uh, they tell you that in order to have good generalization error would be, this is the L01, you should uh, try to uh, minimize this term, which is the Radamacher complexity of your function space, uh, divided by the margin. So essentially the value of F on the worst of the training data. And, uh, and so uh, one way to do it is to control the complexity uh, RF, um, the Radamacher complexity, and maximize the margin. And so um, an obvious way to do this is to use Lagrange multiplier in this kind of uh, uh, minimization with gradient descent, uh, where the Lagrange multiplier term controls uh, the norm of, uh, of, uh, of the layer of the network, and, uh, and you have a, a gradient flow in uh, the norm rho, and this will increase to infinity with time, and you have a gradient flow on uh, um, the normalized matrices V for each. So um, now, it turns out that this is not what rho gradient descent does without this additional Lagrange multiplier term, but several of the methods that are typically used, like uh, uh, batch normalization and especially weight normalization, do um, something very similar or exactly the same in the case of weight normalization. So they, they do something that is uh, um, normalizing the norm while maximizing the margin. Um, so they do what uh, the bound tell um, would like to have. Um, and then uh, it, it, there was a recent observation in a paper of a few months ago by Du, Hu, and Li, um, in which they derived this property of um, the norms during gradient descent. In our notation, the proof is very, very short. If you just l look at the previous equation um, in the previous slide, you can see that rho dot k um, multiply that equation by rho k. You see that uh, rho k time, the time derivative of rho k does not depend on rho k. Okay. And so the consequence of this is that the derivative of the square of rho k, the norm square of each layer, um, is independent of the layer. And, uh, and so if you start with small initialization and the layer have the same norm, then uh, they continue to have the same norm. Um, and, and so the situation is very similar in, in this case to the one in which you impose the constraint VK square equal one with Lagrange multiplier or weight normalization or batch normalization. Okay, so in summary, um, we have some preliminary answer and more detailed ones I expect will come from real mathematicians like Peter and Nati and, um, and we'll hear about some of, about some of them, but uh, an approximation point of view, there are a certain, in general, deep network are not better than shallow network, but there is a certain class of function, hierarchically local functions, for which deep networks um, can be much better in terms of number of parameters than shallow networks. And for optimization, in the case of over-parameterization, stochastic gradient descent will prefer with high probability global minima against other critical points. Um, and in terms of generalization, 
it seems that techniques that people use, like weight batch normalization and, of course, also weight decay, implement generalization in terms of the generalization bounds. And that, uh, for appropriate initialization, then uh, there is an implicit regularization just by gradient descent. And this is quite similar to the linear case when, uh, um, if, you mini if you look for the solution of a underdetermined set of linear equation, we have, of course, an infinite number of solutions, and uh, the pseudo inverse is the one that picks the minimum norm solution. If you are doing gradient descent, gradient descent with zero initial condition, appropriately small initial condition, also converges to the minimum norm solution. Um, and Natis Rebro showed that in the linear case for the exponential loss, um, you have um, the same situation, convergence to, to the minimum norm solution. Um, uh, in that case, um, for any initial condition. I, I, you will probably mention that in this talk. Thank you. Oh, one, one more thing. I think, uh, I think it's silly to compete with companies in terms of deep networks. Why pay them money uh, to do big experiments with deep networks? It's a losing proposition. Um, so, what we should do is really look for something where companies like Google cannot compete with academia. And this is, I think, the intersection of science and engineering. I believe many of the future breakthroughs will come or will be inspired by neuroscience, like they were in the past. You know, deep learning comes from Hubel and Wiesel, and uh, uh, reinforcement learning comes from Pavlov, and so on. So, um, so let's look at that intersection. It will be very difficult for Google, Amazon, um, Facebook to get monkeys in their lab and record from them. Um, they can, but uh, I bet their shareholders will not be happy. And you can make sure they will not be happy. So <laughs> let's go at this intersection. All right. Thank you. The last slide? Yeah. Well, um, there is not too much to explain. We have, um, we have uh, um, a center uh, at, at MIT and includes Harvard, Rockefeller, and other institutions, which is funded by NSF. It's uh, one of the science and technology centers, uh, 50 million over 10 years. And the vision of it is to um, um, to, to develop um, not only the engineering, but especially the science of intelligence. Um, science meaning uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, uh, biology. And uh, um, it has been, I think, quite successful so much that MIT uh, tried to extend this by starting a year ago the quest it was called the uh, IQ, intelligence quest has been changed into the quest for intelligence. And uh, now the quest for intelligence has become the college of computing. So um, this um, 50 million seems to, to become more in terms of donors and the other um, contributions to this larger effort, which is it's, the core is really trying to break interdisciplinary boundaries between these fields of uh, neuroscience and, and uh, machine learning. I think there is a lot to be, to be done there. No, it's not by chance that uh, uh, Demis Asabis, who used to be a postdoc of mine for a short time, but he's uh, um, the head of perhaps arguably the most successful AI outfit uh, this time, but he's a neurophysiologist as a background, right? So I think he understands a bit about, uh, you know, this direction of um, developing an approach to intelligence that is inspired by neuroscience. Thank you very much, Tommy.